I tell folks now that in the good old days of being a livestock market analyst, it seemed simpler, maybe it wasn't, but uh, it seemed simpler because you know, in the good old days, beef demand wasn't changing very much, uh, international trade wasn't very important, and corn was always $2 a bushel. And so, you know, none of that stuff was really moving around much. And, and we spent a lot of time talking about cattle cycle and, and cattle inventories. And if you got a beat on numbers, you had a pretty good beat in general on what the market was going to do. And that really was true for a long time. It's not been true for a number of years, and it won't be true for the foreseeable future. The beef industry has lots of moving parts. It's a big, complex industry. And, and for now several years, and, and certainly going forward, all of those parts are moving. And so it is a really big challenge to get your hands around that. It's a challenge for me to try to get a handle on it and be able to boil it down and bring it to you. I know it's a challenge for you in terms of making the decisions you have to make. Yeah. Since the first of the year, because of the ride we've had, I've started doing a daily update. So last night, I updated this box beef, choice box beef yesterday was just under 219, select was about 217. The five market fed cattle average was 147. This week uh, at Oklahoma City, seven weight steers were about 170, and four weight steers were about 225. In fact, this afternoon, choice box beef went from 218.95 to 221.41. And that's indicative of what we've had all year. We've had these two to seven dollar a day moves. And so literally, if I'm out 30 minutes, it's wrong, okay? It's out of date. Select uh, this afternoon finished at uh, 219 even. Uh, you know, last year in May was the first time we ever went above $2 a pound. We were back at that level, uh, not quite to the, the peak, but, but above $2 a pound at the end of the year. We've been as high as $2.40 since January. And about the third week of January, dropped back down to around $2.07. Now we're back up here to $2.20. Yeah, what I read? $2.21 as of today. Okay, so it has indeed been quite a wild ride. You can see how it, it looks uh, with a little more perspective here. Looking back in history, there's the January average. It was 220 and change, okay, and so well above anything we've ever seen before. And, and you can sort of see how we've gone from this, you know, period back here when it wasn't changing very much. We went through a recession, and then coming out of the recession, we have, in fact, seen this market move up quite a bit. Back it up one level. Fed cattle markets, again, um, we've gone from 130 about Christmas which was a record level, by the way, uh, to as high as 151, 150 and a half in January, back down to around 140, and as of today, back up to 150. Feeder cattle markets, you know, ended the year last year on a high note, uh, record levels, and that's where we are now. We haven't seen as much change in these. Hasn't been as wild a ride, mostly because the feeder cattle markets were already up there relative to the fed cattle and boxed beef market. Cold cow prices, uh, ended the year on a high note last year, came out, uh, you know, already at that 90 cent level or thereabouts, it's up around a dollar. I think this week's range quoted at Oklahoma City for breaking and boning cows was about 96 to 103. You know, these cull cow prices, this was last year's annual average at Oklahoma City for the boning cows. We'll average, I think, safely above 90 cents a pound at the rate we're going. So here's those feeder markets, uh, the calves, the feeder cattle, and the fed cattle again. We have continued to generally improve. We've had some ups and downs along the way, but uh, operating at, at record levels. Did want to share this with you. We haven't seen too much of this yet in Oklahoma. These are open commercial heifers selling through regular weekly feeder auctions. And basically what we're seeing is these heifers, uh, essentially feeder heifers in another world, but they're not feeder heifers. They're being sold as replacements, and they're all bringing anywhere from $1,100 to $1,500 a head. The point is we're going to see a lot of these heifers in many cases are bringing as much or more than the steers, steer mates at the same weight, uh, and we'll see more of that before it's over with. As of January 1, uh, we confirmed what we thought was that January, that uh, 2013 was a net liquidation year. All cattle and calves was down another 1.8%. Beef cows were down less than 1%, but almost 0.9, 9 tenths of a percent. Uh, the calf crop last year was down another 1%. If you like records, this all cattle inventory was the smallest since 1951. This beef cow herd was the smallest since 1962. And this U.S. calf crop, including both beef and dairy, was the smallest since 1949. 
And that's important to have in mind. There's good reasons why we're talking about record high prices. A couple things in this, the feeder supply does continue to get smaller. Obviously when the calf crop continues to get smaller uh, and we're shaving more heifers, which we are up here, that feeder supply continues to get tighter. Okay, with a smaller cow herd, the 2014 calf crop will probably be a tick smaller yet. And this may be the low, although we don't know for sure. So here's a little perspective on this thing. You know, again, you got to go farther than this chart goes back in, uh, to 1954. It's 1951, the last time we were at this level. And really what's important here is, is kind of going back to this peak in the mid-90s. This was sort of the last cyclical, uh, you know, sort of cattle cycle, that traditional thing that, that used to be all we had to watch. Uh, from this peak in, in the mid-90s, we have gotten smaller 16 of the last 18 years. And part of what's important here in terms of the all cattle inventory and even more so on the, uh, on the beef cow herd is that probably 11 or 12 of those years of liquidation were not due to the cattle cycle in the historic classic sense. You know, the, we've always had the cattle cycle. We've had this tendency to produce our way up to lower prices and then we, you know, take our beating and we cut back until prices go back up again. That's the sort of self-correcting cattle cycle that we like to think about. Most of the liquidation that's happened over the last 10 or 12 years has not been due to that. It's been due to other things, a series of other things that contributed to that. The Oklahoma story in terms of the current inventory is a little bit different. All cattle and calves was up 2.4%. Beef cows were up 2.9%. We did actually hang on to a few more cows last year. Um, the calf crop was unchanged. But, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the beef replacement heifer, this is probably the biggest one in here, was up 16%. Now, this was an extremely low level, historically, for Oklahoma in, the, in January of 2013. Uh, but nevertheless, this net increase of uh, 45,000 head of beef replacement heifers in Oklahoma was the biggest of any state in the country on January 1. Okay, so we're ready to do it. Um, conditions improved somewhat in the last part of last year and, and, and this reflects that. So here's the story with the beef cow herd. The U.S. cow herd continues to get smaller down to this 29 million head level measured over here. In Oklahoma, for many of those years that the herd, the national herd was falling, Oklahoma was growing until 2011 and then 2012 took a few more out and so this little bit of growth, this 2.9 percent uh, this last year takes us from here to here the real story, of course, is that we're still 10.5% down from where we were at the beginning of 2011. So it may be a start if we can sustain it, but we got a long ways to go in terms of rebuilding our herd. If we have a dry first half of this year, we could see net liquidation again or at least no growth. Okay, Even if the second half of the year is somewhat better. Um, on the other hand, if we can get some moisture relatively soon, we can actually put together some decent uh, herd expansion, I think, this year because the pieces are in place. We've got the heifers, uh, we've got the market signals for sure, we just need a little bit of chance in terms of some rainfall to make it all happen, okay? The other thing that has to happen is we have to maintain a decrease in cow slaughter. Those are the two pieces to herd expansion. We've had elevated beef cow slaughter for the last six years. It dropped off sharply in the second half of last year. In the final quarter of the year, beef cow slaughter was down about 18% year over year. But in the first half of the year, it was still up year over year from the year before because of the continuing drought conditions in the first, con in the first half of last year, the, uh, the long cold winter that a lot of folks endured last year, uh, and of course we've had some cold weather this year too. But um, you know, the bottom line is compared to, these are both measured as a percent of the cow herd, to get herd expansion on a sustained basis, heifer retention will be up here at this upper end. You know, again, where the solid line stops is the current data. It's higher than it was back in the, in the early 90s. Um, we need to do that for two or three years, save a fairly high percentage of our heifers, and at the same time, cut down culling significantly. And if we can do both of those things, we can put together herd expansion. We have not been able to do both of them for the last several years. We sometimes done one or the other, uh, but we have not been able to do both at the same time. So if conditions permit, we could be in herd expansion for the rest of this decade. And we have not seen sustained herd expansion five or six years in length since the early 1990s in this industry. That would be something different for us to be able to do that. 
One of the things that helped this winter compared to a year ago was that U.S. hay stocks improved based on better forage conditions in the second half of 2013 or the second two-thirds of 2013. So we did have on De December 1st in the U.S. significantly improved hay stocks from the record low the year before. And, and that helps us get through this winter in better shape. In Oklahoma, we had 34% year-over-year uh, -year increases in the December 1 hay stocks. So after two years of very low hay stocks, we had more hay this winter going in. Uh, that's good because we've had lots of cold weather and we've utilized a fair amount of it, but at least we're in better shape to get through the winter. We may not have a whole bunch left when it's over with, but it gives us a better chance at least of sustaining the, the, the kinds of herd expansion plans that, that we appear to have in place at this point. Corn prices are down significantly. We did, after four years of trying, put together a record corn crop last year. So by mid-year last year, going into harvest, corn prices began to drop dramatically. And so here we are in the upper fours as opposed to the mid sevens. Uh, that obviously has a huge impact on some sectors directly and all of the industry indirectly as we go forward. One thing that hasn't changed as much, and you may be noticing this if you're having to buy a winter supplement, is that protein prices have not come down. And so, you know, we've been pretty focused on energy feeds in the corn market for the last several years. Uh, now that that one's got some at least temporary relief in it, one of the things that just jumped back up is that protein prices continue to be a challenge. Uh, and that'll be a challenge not only from the standpoint of users buying it, but also implications going forward in terms of what we're going to plant in this country uh, with respect to corn and soybeans and, and things like that. Cattle slaughter is expected to be down about 7 plus percent this year. You know, uh, the last two years we've had decreases in slaughter, but not real big ones, largely because the drought has played into, into pushing more cattle through the packing plants than uh, we would have done otherwise. Year to date, beef production is down 8%. We're projecting it on an annual basis to be down about 6.5%. Beef or total cattle slaughter, not beef cow, but total cow slaughter, cattle slaughter so far this year is down 8%. But the other side of that coin is, and, and this is the thing, I get a lot of questions. Probably the most common question I've gotten for the last 18 months is, when does beef price itself out of the market? Well, you know, or sometimes it's phrased this way, when will people quit eating beef? People aren't going to quit eating beef, okay? People are going to change their behavior. Uh, maybe a few quit eating beef, but in general, people aren't going to quit eating beef, okay? Uh, and in fact, we're not going to have as much beef, so the market needs to ration it to some extent. You know, we're going to find out what markets do best, and that is who wants it the most and let them have it, okay? And that's what we're doing, and so far, it's working okay. Last year, every month, year over year, we had an increase in retail prices. January's number was, again, another increase in that, and and you can sort of see, again, how much retail prices have actually gone up for beef. Competing meats, pork won't be much of an issue. I don't have time to get into the story, but the bottom line is the disease issues that you probably have seen something of. The PED virus uh, has wiped out uh, much of the anticipated 2014 gains in pork production. In fact, if it keeps going unchecked as it is right now, we could, uh, you know, we could take away all of the net year-over-year -year gains and, and maybe even be looking at less pork if this continues for many more weeks. Broiler production will be up about 3.4%. So yes, there'll be some additional pork or poultry on the market. Uh, the good news, again, part of that good beef demand story is, even though there's a relative abundance of poultry on the market, their wholesale prices suck. Okay, and they'd be the first to tell you that. Um, they were counting on high beef prices to carry their planned increases in poultry production and it ain't working so far. Okay, so that's good news from a beef industry perspective. Let me do just a bit on trade very quickly. 2013 beef exports were up. They will probably drop in the next couple of years, mostly because we're not going to produce as much beef. And so in fact, as a percent of production, it won't change very much. Our prices are going to be very high. That does matter in international markets along with exchange rates. Imports will probably be up slightly. Wouldn't be surprising given the price levels we have in the U.S. market and the fact that much of what we import is stuff to make ground beef out of and ground beef accounts for fully half or more of our beef consumption in this country. And in fact, it's been the thing driving it so far. All of the increase we've had in January and February 
in the wholesale beef market has really been driven by end meats and trimmings. Uh, last year we saw a sharp drop in Mexican cattle imports, about 30% from the year before. Uh, they don't have the cattle to continue exporting at the rate they did in 11 and 12. And uh, so far this year we're down another 18%. Okay, just a little bit to try to bring it back down to where you live. Okay, all this stuff is out there. And I did want to give you enough so that you can hopefully have some perspective on why the market's where it's at and, and how you form your expectations for the next several years uh, you know, relative to uh, the opportunities and challenges that, that you face. These are Oklahoma's, Oklahoma prices, um, and, and they sort of tell the story back to the lows last year in June. Uh, this is steers by weight, so from calves to heavy feeders. You can see how the market increased from June to September to November. Uh, you'll notice since November to last week, you know, the, the feeder prices are not changing much. Okay, again, those, those uh, high feeder prices are, and, and the cheaper corn that we have now is fully uh, bid into this market at the feedlot level. What we have continued to see is the calf prices have continued to advance a little bit. If you take these prices for the blue line here and put them into this god-awful table with all these numbers, these are those prices by weight for the previous slide. So here's the values per head. We're selling these calves at $1,000 to $1,100 a piece. The market's telling you to make more calves. All right, doesn't take a PhD to figure that out. And of course your response is, well, give me some moisture and I will. Right, okay, and, and so that's where we're at on that. But I wanted you to be aware that, you know, in, in addition to that, if you're a stocker producer or if you're a cow-calf producer that maybe wants to consider the flexibility to retain your own calves for a bit, you know, depending on what weight you start with, 400 all the way up to 650 pounds, if you put 250 pounds of gain on them, that's these yellow boxes for each weight, the value of those pounds is pretty consistently from about 80 cents to over 90 cents a pound. You know, so from a stocker perspective, maybe from a stocker's lender's perspective, these uh, $1,100 calves are really scary. Um, but, it, but the, you know, do the economics work? Even at these price levels, you know, the market's still got a pretty strong signal. This value right here, this value of gain at the stocker level really reflects the cost of gain at the feedlot. And with cheaper corn, that's about where feedlots are at in that 80 to 90 cent range for a cost of gain. Okay, and so the market's telling you your forage has that much value if you can put it on and feedlots even at four something dollar corn would like to buy more pounds than they did when it was two dollars corn. Okay, they'd, they'd rather buy more of those pounds from you and have you put that weight on for them. So that opportunity is there and, and that's sort of the bottom line here. We're getting a signal on the one hand to expand the herd. The market's screaming at us with these high prices to, to produce more calves. We're smaller than we need to be as an industry. At the same time, your forage is worth a lot. So however you use forage is a good thing. Okay, and in fact that's the lesson for all of you is that your forage is worth more and you've got more flexibility on how to use it than you've had in a long time. It's not a bad time to be in the forage business. If we could just grow some forage, that would help. Right? So that's something that's different. Cow-calf producers will probably see record returns this year. Even the ones that aren't managing as well as they should will probably see record returns. But we do need to manage as well as we can and manage cost and maximize the opportunity for net returns in this market environment. I don't think markets are going to be your biggest problem for the next several years, to be honest with you. I think if you have something to sell, it's going to sell pretty well. Okay, Where can you help yourself the most relative to that? I think you need to focus on managing production, produce something to sell, and the cost of production as best you can. And take advantage of those opportunities, particularly if you gotta go buy some of them $1,400 heifers to rebuild your herd. It's gonna take every bit of net return you can muster to finance the cows we need to rebuild the, the cattle industry in this state. I got one little bit here. How do you save costs? How do you manage cost of production? Well, there's probably a number of things you can consider, but I wanna show you one. In, in the, this is other hay production per beef cow so I take statewide the total tons of other hay production that we use to support our beef herd primarily, divide it by the number of beef cows, and I looked at that all the way back to 1960. 
And what you'll find here is in the, from 1960 through the mid-1980s, we put up on average less than a ton of hay per beef cow. For the last 15 years, we've put up over two tons of hay per beef cow. The numbers work out like this. The average for that 15 year period was 0.87 tons per cow. That's 1,740 pounds of cow. For the most recent 15 year period, it's 2.05 tons. That's 4,100 tons of hay per cow. Now my question to you is, do we need 2,360 more pounds of hay now than we did back then? Okay, a 300 pound bigger cow don't eat a ton more per year. But that'll account for about 20% of that. Uh, so that's one question is that doesn't explain the extra hay. My other question is, do they need to be bigger? Are you better off for them being bigger? Okay, that's a question you have to answer. I don't pretend to have the answer today, but you know, I think, they, I think there's no doubt they have gotten bigger. I'm not sure that they should have gotten bigger in many cases. And I think that's something producers need to take a look at, particularly if they're down now in numbers and they're gonna be rebuilding. Think about what you really wanna put out there, what you should be putting out there. I think most of the rest of that increase in hay has gone to one of two things, or both. I think we're wasting a fair amount of it, and I think we're probably subsidizing our grazing periods by feeding them longer than we used to. Okay, and I just made up some rough numbers. If you split that extra, once you account for the 300 pound bigger cow, if you split the rest of that between these two uses, uh, you know, you're probably, you could be wasting 50% on net of that extra hay production and you could be feeding an extra month longer than you used to. Do you need to do that? You have to answer that. I'm not saying it's wrong, but I do think it's important to ask the question because it's possible that we're doing stuff out of habit and out of convenience and out of some other reasons that maybe we haven't thought about in a while in terms of justifying it. Round bales are easy and convenient. And there's not a thing wrong with that if you manage it. But they make it easy, first of all, to put up a lot of stuff for hay that may not have been really suited for hay production in the first place. Second of all, if you don't store it right, you're going to lose a big chunk of it as it melts into the ground out by the barn. And the fourth part of it is if you just spike it and drop it off, the cows are going to trump 30 to 60 percent of it into the ground anyway. I think there's 50 to $100 a cow in better grazing management combined with better hay management that's on the table for many producers, not everybody, but many producers in this state. So bottom line, packers will struggle, feedlots will struggle with both margins and volumes. There is value in backgrounding or, or in, in the stocker side of the industry as well as in the cow-calf side of the industry. We're at record level prices and we're gonna see higher prices yet. That's about the scariest thing an economist can say, betting against history, but we're at record levels and, and we're just at the front end of a long ride to rebuild this industry. I think it takes most of the rest of the decade. We're selling $1,000 calves and $1,000 cull cows today. I think we'll do it for five years. With that, I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs>